what I do today is when I go out and research what I have to do for myself to change my own personal athletic performance, how can I then turn around with my team at Cargill and apply that to a horse? Because as much as even AQHA funds research and other industries and universities fund research, we're nowhere near what goes on in the human equine or the human athletic world. You know, feeding the Olympic athletes, feeding the NFL, uh, feeding all that stuff that goes on in humans. And if you take out a certain function of the horse, of the cecum, where a horse can digest hay, a horse and a human are very, very similar. I mean, there's only really three species on earth that perform athletic performance, humans, horses, and dogs. And dogs don't really count because they don't sweat, they metabolize things differently, they're just not the same. Humans and horses are very similar. So where we may not have some of the funding in equine nutrition research to do what we do with humans, what we've tried to do is apply that, what we know from the human side, into horses, verify that it works and roll, to bring you level of athletic performance that rivals that. Sometimes we're ahead. Sometimes we're ahead with equine nutrition. Uh, anybody heard of the keto diet? I just did the keto diet for human, you know, Lisa raised her hand, you know, where you, you get rid of carbs, you go high fat, high protein. Everybody heard of a modern horse feed? We're ahead of humans. I just did that keto diet and lost 10 pounds in about two months. But my athletic performance increased significantly. So that's what I'm gonna talk to you about. That's my background, that's my history. So me as an amateur, this is me giving back to you and maybe it's my retribution for for uh, being yelled at from the professionals is now I get to turn around and teach you guys, try to teach you guys something. So I do work for Cargill Animal Nutrition. Most of you may not know us as Cargill. Most of you recognize the brand Neutrina, and that is our large mainstream nationwide brand of horse feed. I think, we've, I think this is our 17th or 18th year as, as an AQHA corporate partner. But we are owned by Cargill. And... Um, you know, as I think they were talking last night about, you know, some of the other corporate partners, you know, most people don't realize who Cargill is and um, actually how tied to the horse industry we are. Uh, Cargill is the, actually the largest privately held company in the world. I have 140,000 colleagues. <laughs> um, we had annual sales last year of $109 billion dollars but we're privately held. Um, our animal nutrition division is one of the largest platforms in Cargill. Um, but other things you may not know about Cargill is, anybody eat McDonald's eggs on a regular basis, driving to shows, you know, or anybody see the eggs at the omelet stand this morning, the liquid eggs? Every egg that our McDonald's buys or most liquid eggs in the world come from Cargill. Um, we supply most of the grain that goes into pizza dough at Pizza Hut. We touch, we feed a billion people a day in some way, shape, or form. And guess what? We're invested in the horse industry. We have three of our shareholders who are family members, there are no Cargills left today, that are actively involved in horses. They don't show quarters, they're doing hunter jumper and dressage. But Karen McMillan, Lucy Stinson, and Gwendolyn Meyer are all family members of the Cargill family that are interested in what we're doing in the horse industry. And they drive our investment in the horse industry. The relationship with AQHA that Cargill has is the largest sponsorship in Cargill Inc., period. Um, that's how invested Cargill is in the horse industry and how we love to give back. Now, we appear a little brand confused, so I do want to get up here. Obviously, with an AQHA, we go for it as the Neutrina brand. We have other brands in the marketplace. So as you're out there in the marketplace, depending on what part of the country you're on, you may see other brands that are all, actually, the only place you'll see Cargill and a lot of them is on the back of a feed tag. Um, Neutrina is our big one. Uh, Safe Choice is the largest selling feed in the United States. Um, another one is Progressive Nutrition, who I'll mention some of the products today. 
um, that has uh, more of a supplement. If really where we get into some of the unique technology is more of that supplement company that we are involved with. And then we actually just launched a brand actually in the fall called Pro Elite, going after the upper end of the market. It's ultra premium. If you want to feed with everything in it, that's Pro Elite. Um, so, but those are our brands that you see out in the marketplace. The big one is obviously Neutrina. So, when it comes into getting in the presentation, you know, what I'm trying to drive or there's three factors and obviously there's more, but to break it down into simple facts, there's three factors that drive any type of anything with a horse. And we'll focus on athletic performance in this situation. But there's three, three basic factors. You have control of two. There's genetics, there's nutrition, and there's management. Yeah, we have a little bit of influence on genetics. I saw Dr. Squires in the, you know, in the room a little while ago. You know, we can do a lot with reproduction, but you can still breed a, a world champion to a world champion and still get a dink. It happens. It's a little bit of the luck of the draw. Nutrition and management, you have direct control over. You have direct influence on. And the, the maximum area in a triangle is an equilateral triangle where you maximize all three of those areas. My role, as, or the role of your feed and nutrition, is to make sure the nutrition leg of that triangle is not reduced. That the management, which is your training, your care, your everything you do at a, on a daily basis at your facility, works. The nutrition, we don't want to be that nutrition, be that limiting factor. But nutrition is that important. It fuels everything. So whether you're roping, whether you're jumping, whether you got a pleasure horse, whether you got a barrel horse, nutrition is critical in maximizing the athletic potential of that horse. And nutrition and management are really trying to get that horse to reach that genetic potential. Unfortunately, you can't exceed their genetic potential. I had a trainer one time come up and at, tell me, and I, I'll, they'll na remain nameless and said, man, your feed just made this horse grow too big. This horse is only supposed to be 15 hands and it's 16 hands and it's your feed's fault. I'm like, I am not that powerful. That horse had that genetic potential to do that. The feed just brought it out and the management just brought it out. So keep that in mind. My focus is gonna be that bottom bar and then combining it with your management and how you train and your program allows that to happen. Another thing to keep in mind, and we'll discuss some per visual changes that you can evaluate in your horses at the beginning, but a lot of what I'm gonna get into later on is talking about how to manage to prevent performance loss first. There will be a loss in performance in your horses before you see a change in that horse visually. By the time you're coming to me or uh, your veterinarian or uh, another nutritionist from our company or somebody else and say, my horse looks like crap, that performance is that, of that horse has suffered for a significant length of time already. Performance changes always occur before visual changes. So you can use visual. Most of the people in this room, your horses all look amazing. Those of you I know, I see them, they look amazing. So you're not going to be able to judge this based on visual appraisal. You may get a horse in from a client and we'll give you some, some things to look at to do some visual appraisals that you, you want to change and improve. But when they're showing at the caliber you are, your horses look amazing. What we're going to deal with is how to, because the performance loss is subtle. But if you feed them properly, you know it's there. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry if it's not, if it's losing performance or not. Body condition score. How many heard of body condition scoring? How many went to A&M in the 80s? You know, body condition score's been around there. Dr. Henneke and others, they, f they developed this system back in the 80s. It is the standard of how to tell whether a horse is fat or thin. You know, scale of one to nine, how to tell whether that horse is fat or thin. We've tried to break it down a little simpler, 
in the less than four, between five and six, and greater than eight. And this was when, when I was in sales and still when I consult pe with people, some they say, well, what's the ideal score? And I'm like, I don't really care. It matters to you. You know, I'll, I'll pick on Ann and Chester in the crowd since I know them and I, I worked with them for a long time. When Ann and Chester had halter horses in their barn, they probably wanted a horse that was a little heavier than now that they got a bunch of hunter under saddle horses in the barn. Am I right? Yeah. Basically, the rule of thumb that I always went by, if that horse is between a five or a six, I'm happy. You tell me as a trainer, dependent upon your industry, dependent upon your discipline, where you want it in that five to six range. A five horse, you can't see ribs, but you can feel them. The main thing when you're dealing with this is make sure, and, and tell your clients this probably more than you, go home and use your hands on your horses. Um, one of the uh, fortunate customers I had when I was in sales, and they still call me, I talked to him this week, is Disney World. And so if anybody goes Disney World, Disneyland, uh, all those horses at those locations, and most people don't realize there's 100 horses at Disney World just down the road an hour and a half. There's 100 horses on that facility. If you ever want to donate a horse to be ridden by, any, ridden by anybody in the world on a two and a half mile trail ride that's that safe, Disney will take it because they're searching for horses like that. Um, but they, they brought me a pony one time and they said, oh, this pony's, this, pony's, this pony's fat. And I'm like, put my hands on it like I should. And I'm like, you guys are gonna be really disappointed with this pony when it sheds out. You're gonna be hiding it in the back 40 because I can, every rib is visible. You gotta get your hands on horses. You gotta get your hands on, get your customers, get the hands on and feel the fat cover on those horses. I focus on ribs. The Henneke scale goes all over the body. Ironically, as you deal with different breeds and different disciplines, when I deal with crusty, crusty necks or fat over the tail head or fat behind the shoulders, you get a lot of breed variation with that. Quarter horses, we tend to get that fat pocket above the tail head when they get really heavy. Morgans will get that crusty neck and you'll see a rib. The ribs tend to be universal, so I really focus on the rib, but I don't have to get into breed differences with the horses. Five to six, your halter horses might be sevens, maybe not where we want them to be, but that's, they might be there. Your broodmares might be sevens or eights. That, that's okay. Anything below a four, your third, some of your thoroughbred, your racing horses might be a four because they don't want them carrying that extra weight. Below a three, somebody's probably not happy. Twos and ones, somebody's calling the Humane Society. So, um, but that's, that's been around forever. What we did in Cargill, started in progressive nutrition and brought it into Cargill, was within what we found about 10 years ago, it used to be 10 years ago, feeds were all formulated pretty adequate from a, ironically, because our protein and amino acid sources are relatively cost effective. Um, formulated with pretty good protein amino acids. So horses, you could judge it based on body condition. Um, but what we started getting phone calls from about when grain prices went through the roof and everything went haywire with the economy, was we started getting phone calls with people saying, I can't feel a rib, but I can see every vertebrae on my horse. I've got horses that I can't fit a saddle to. I've got horses that are sunken in in the withers, they look like a dairy cow over their hips, but I can't feel a rib. So what we got to explore and what we got to looking at is one maybe issue within the Henneke system was it, a, it considered fat and muscle as the same. But the nutrition to fuel fat or calor is calories, the nutrition to fuel, mu fuel muscle is not calories, it's amino acids and protein. So we separated those systems. And we gave a system now from A through D or you can go to toplinebalance.com and you can actually say my horse is this and go through these little sliders on a digitally rendered horse and it will give your horse, you can put each horse through this system and it will give your horse an A through a D grade based on whether their top line's adequate. An A is obviously they are fully muscled all the way across their top line. A D horse has poor withers, they're sunken at the withers and I'm not talking high withered, I'm not talking are they bad backed in terms of low? I'm talking that muscle on the side of the vertebrae. 
Are they sunken in in the withers? Are they sunken into the mid back and the loin? Are they sunken in the hip and croup area? A D horse, it's bad all the way across the top. We decided not to get any horses in F because that probably just wouldn't go over real well to flunk anyone. You know, everybody needs to win in today's society. Um, but now, when, if, as we teach customers this and clients this, I ask them. They say my horse is thin. I ask, are they thin across the ribs or are they thin across the top line? Because if they're thin across the ribs, I'm recommending calories. If they're th low or th what they define as thin across the top line, I'm looking at that diet's amino acid and protein profile. We can influence a top line in a horse in 30 days and not change a body condition score. That rib cover will remain the same, but I can fill in a top line in 30 days if I have the proper amino acids and protein in that diet. Those are the visual changes. So those, all those, when those are not good, we have already resulted in performance loss. I'm gonna share some numbers coming up, which I know everybody loves numbers in a presentation, but it, 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 it's more to drive home the point of where this all comes from. But everything I talk about from here on out is really talking about how do you avoid and how do you deal with that performance loss because your horses all look good already or they should and most of your horses look good today. Muscle is that equine engine. When we look at, you know, take Sam's Mustang from the prior one or whether it's a Western Hauler or a Semi that the ELD doesn't like and whatever it is, um, that the muscle of that horse is that engine. That is what drives them. That is what allows them to do what we need them to do to win. So we can, we can fuel and deal with that muscle two different ways. The recovery and development of it, and then the fueling of it. So gasoline is what the fuel is. We'll talk about that second. So we, first of all, you gotta find what muscle is. You have a car, you have a truck, we all go, what's the horsepower? How much torque does it have? How much, how much, what's its towing capacity? When we're dealing with muscle, what is muscle made from? Most of muscle is water. And that's mostly what muscle is by weight. If I take, we won't use horses in this example because we don't like it in the United States, but if I take a cow and I turn it into beef jerky, which is removing the water, what I have left is 73% protein. Muscle is made from protein. You'll see protein on the first thing on a feed tag. You'll see protein usually the first or second item on a forage test. Don't get hung up on the term protein. Protein is like, um, protein is like the, the, alpha, the English language, the alphabet. Um, you know, when I, if I had Webster's Dictionary, it's very long, it's very, it's very big, it's got hundreds of thousands of words on it. That is protein. There's hundreds of thousands of different proteins out there in nature. What's important to the horse is the amino acids that make it up. There's about 20 of them. There's a bait, there's pseudo, pseudo amino acids, and there's all these others, but about 20 of them. How many letters are in the English language? 26. 26 letters make all the words in that Webster's Dictionary. That's how, pro, that's how amino acids work. Different combinations, different lengths make different proteins. The essential amino acids, which are like the vowels in the English language, are what are critical for the horse. So we may use protein and amino acids interchangeably in nutrition, and, and, but really say in, in what I'm talking about, I'm really talking about amino acids. The essential amino acids, there are 10 of them, that is like the vowels, A, E, I, O, and U, in the English language. What happens when you take A, E, I, O, and U out to Webster's Dictionary? I was taught you couldn't make a word. Maybe they've invented a word today that, doesn't ha that has all consonants but I don't think they have. If I take these amino acids, these 10 essential amino acids, words like lysine, methionine, threonine, leucine, tryptophan, all those, the horse cannot produce them. The horse has to take them in through their diet. 
The other 10 or 11 or 12 out there in nature, the horse can produce. They can synthesize them from these, they can produce them themselves. Those 10 amino acids, the horse has to take in through the, through the diet. This is why a horse is different from a ruminant or a cow. A cow has no amino acid requirement. The rumen of the cow, the cow can create every one of these themselves. That's what makes them able to live on tree bark. Not tree bark, but, you know, some, some of our ruminants do. That, that's why they can live on such, such low-quality forage. You add a little nitrogen to straw, and a cow will live. You do that to the horse, and they're going to suffer. This is the same thing for humans. On a normal feed tag, you'll see lysine, methionine, threonine, some of them you'll see tryptophan. Don't worry when you hear tryptophan as a calming agent because it doesn't work. Um, where we're talking when it comes to performance horses and, and producing that better performance are those 10, but there's three there in the middle, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, what we call branch chains, which really drive muscle recovery and how fast that muscle recovers day to day. They all have a function, they all have a place, they all have a specific need, but those are the three that we're really focused on when it comes to animal performance. When it comes to amino acids, there's this little phenomena that we call limiting amino acids, and the best way we can describe that is, is Liebig's barrel, which is an analogy. If you, if you take a whiskey barrel, obviously full of whiskey, and I take one stay, and each stay of that barrel represents an amino acid. And I reduce the levels of those stays to different heights. How much whiskey can I get into that barrel? <coughs> Only to the lowest stay. Same thing happens with amino acids. So if I formulate or if I have a feed that is formulated to 100% of my branch chains or 100% of lysine, but I have one of those 10 essential amino acids that's at, 90, at 70%, every other amino acid works at 70% efficiency. It won't, it, it, if I have leucine at 70% and lysine's at 100, I'm wasting 30% of my lysine. The, that's why amount of amino acid and ratios of amino acid are critical when it comes to these diets. The swine industry, the chicken industry, the poultry industry, because they have, are light years ahead of us where we're at in horses. The human side is light years ahead of us. That's where we're applying this nutrition to our horses to say we can get really close and to bring about that performance of that horse to its maximum genetic potential. So just remember that it's not about the overall amount, it's also about if any one of those is short, everything is, all of those 10 now become short. So where are you getting these amino acids from? Not talking feed here, not talking about our products, but where are you gonna get them from on a normal everyday basis? So corn, not a lot of us feed corn today, it's kinda went, out, it went by the wayside, but at a crude protein level and a lysine level of 0.2, and I'm just focused on lysine here, 1,200 pound horse needs 31 grams of lysine in a day. You have to feed 34 pounds of corn to meet that. Not gonna happen. You're probably calling your vet before a colic or a founder or something else way before that happens on a daily basis. Grass hay that's six actually has a higher lysine content than the corn or the same or a lower crude protein, 34 pounds of grass hay. Depend upon the horse, that might be possible, but that's a lot of grass hay. A grass hay that's a 14, that's 14 pounds. That's a reasonable amount. In fact, it might be just a touch low in terms of total hay intake. The interesting thing is those are actually forage samples that we took from the same pasture or the same hay field, fertilized under the same conditions, cut two weeks apart. The number one thing you can talk to your hay producer about on making better quality hay is to cut it at the right time. That's the same hay cut two weeks apart. The more mature it is in the field, the poorer quality it is. Corn gluten, you aren't gonna see in horse feeds, it's a, more of a cattle product, but it's a 60% crude protein. This is where crude protein is a little misleading. So it's a 60% crude, but it's a 0.8 lysine. I have to feed eight pounds of corn gluten. 
reasonable amount, you're not going to feed corn gluten, but the comparison is soybean meal, which is the best plant-based source protein we can feed to horses, is a 48% crude, but it's a 3.1 lysine. So I only have to feed 2.2 pounds of soy to do what 8 pounds of corn gluten or 34 pounds of corn would do. The new one we have access to today that we're using in some supplements and we're starting to see coming to mainstream feed is whey protein concentrate. Anybody in here drink protein shakes themselves, like muscle milk or any of those? Look at the ingredient listing. It will have whey protein concentrate or whey protein isolate in it. 78% uh, protein, 6.6 .6 lysine, a pound a day. Downside of whey protein concentrate is it cost me as an ingredient buyer about $5,000 a ton, where soy is about $300. So not something you're going to use in everyday life, but it's for that athletic performance. Not, the only better protein source in nature than milk is egg. So when we can feed milk proteins to our horses, we come close to biologically perfect proteins. And that's what we're trying to do. So how much does your horse need? How much does your performance horse need on a, on a daily basis? Again, kind of ignore the numbers, watch the trends. Because one unfortunate thing that we get asked for always in the feed industry is, well, do I need a 10 or a 12% protein or do I need a 14? Because when we go look at our labels and our food in our cabinets, you don't see a percentage anywhere on a label on our, for our own foods. It's all grams or milligrams or something to that effect. By law, we have to list things by percentages, which is a little misleading because it all ties back then to how much are you feeding or, or you know, and what are you feeding it with, you know, um, you know, I tell people all the time, if you get an 80% on a test, how many questions do you get right? We don't know until you know how many questions are on the test. Well, I'm feeding, I get questions, I'm feeding an 8% or I'm feeding a 10% protein feed, that enough? Well, how much of it? You know, one pound of a 30% is the same thing as three pounds of a 10% in terms of actual protein content. What I'm really trying to impress here though is we tend to express feeding or protein levels in percentages. But because as a horse increases in activity level, so I've got a 1,200 pound horse, I've defined work, NRC defines work as light, moderate, and intense. Light is up to one hour a day, five to six days a week. Sorry to say most trainers, that's most horses. I mean, they may get into intense training at a show, but most times they're in light training. Moderate's one to three hours, intense is over three hours. I go from an eight and a half percent on a maintenance horse, so yard art, standing out there doing nothing, to a 12 on intense training when I look at percentage. Well, that doesn't look like a big change. But that maintenance 1,200 pound horse is gonna need about 15 pounds a day of something, maybe 20. That intense training horse is gonna need about 34 pounds of feed a day, hay and grain combined. So my lysine need goes from 31 grams to 68 grams. It actually doubles. So the percentage that you see displayed at times is confusing and misleading. Unfortunately, I wish they would allow us to change how we display these. Because that over there is actually what means something. That protein and that lysine requirement actually doubles as their intensity of training doubles. Same thing as the weight increases. So that's really the perception I'm wanting you to get through that. Different amino acids help differently. Um, this is a, one of our human studies we used as a comparison. And again, don't, it's kind of for talking points, so I forget, remember where I'm going more than anything. But the white bar, there's a white bar there, there's a white bar there, white bar there, is the muscle, muscle breakdown, synthesis, oxidation and net balance, or what's left after you do all your math ma mathematics, on a human athlete that ate a carbohydrate-based diet. So a heavy carb diet for a human athlete, you can see that their breakdown, and then they were exposed to exercise. The breakdown was the highest of any of the three groups. The synthesis here 
is moderate. The oxidation and, and the, 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 a little bit of breakdown is low, but the net balance is that human that was on a carbohydrate, carbohydrate heavy diet and exposed or went through an exercise regime actually lost muscle mass after exercise. So that would be a horse that's on a sweet feed, a really heavy, poorly fortified sweet feed, not typical today. If we come in with a properly balanced feed with a good amino acid profile, you know, there's a lot of them out in the industry. We've got them in Neutrina with, like, say, Proforce. Um, you can see the muscle breakdown because they, we've added amino acids back. The muscle breakdown following exercise is significantly reduced. The synthesis is significantly increased. This is making sense. The oxidation is about the same. So the net balance is significantly higher. Okay. Okay, let's follow logic. In this example, with the black bar, they then came in and added, within 45 minutes following exercise, a whey protein concentrate supplement. And the 45 minutes following exercise is critical. Breakdown is even less. Synthesis isn't quite as high, but the breakdown overall is less, and the net balance is highest. What they found, and what we can do with our horses, is if you feed these whey protein or branch chain amino acid products 45, within a 45 minute window following daily training or exercise, the body is at its peak efficiency to absorb those amino acids and it moves it into the muscle faster, and it actually stops the muscle breakdown that occurs from exercise. 45 minutes, though. Now, how many in here, when you get done riding a horse, you take it back and tie it in a stall and let it cool out? Most of us. That's the ideal time. I mean, they're standing there cooling out. When I get done with a training ride on a bike or running, the first thing I do is I try to go drink milk or a whey protein concentrate of some sort within 45 minutes of exercise. It keeps the body, you know that soreness you get, you know, we've all blamed it on lactic acid and all of it's part of it. Some of it's muscle breakdown, some of it's muscle tearing, which actually builds stronger muscle. But if we do that right then and there, that body recovers faster. So that's where, like, if we come in with some form of a post-exercise supplementation right after exercise, you can enhance that recovery, reduce that muscle breakdown, and improves long-term training. We did a survey two years ago for AAP, to all AAP veterinarians, asking them how much of lameness did they attribute to muscle issues. And the response back, it's not scientific, this is just their gut feeling of, you know, when they get that horse, man, I've, I've, every joint's fine, but that's still lame somewhere. They attribute about 30 to 40% of lameness to some type of muscle issue. Could be a muscle recovery issue. I know if I don't recover right, I'm kind of lame when I'm going out on my run the next day. You know, a judge would call me out. How much of it's muscle? I mean, it's, a, it's, it's very hard to diagnose, but it's pretty, it's pretty easy to deal with. But there is that 45-minute window. If you can't get it into them 45 minutes after exercise, you got to wait two hours. At that point in time, you might as well just go with the regular feeding program when you're going to feed morning and night. It's not as effective as that 45-minute window, but it will work. So when it comes to fueling that engine, you know, we've got the, we've got the engine tuned. We've got the engine working in proper order. We've got all the spark plugs going. Now we got to... Now we've got to figure out what octane of fuel we're going to give it. Are we going to give it diesel fuel? Are we going to give it ethanol? Or what kind of fuel are we going to give it? This is where the horse industry spent a fair amount of time discussing things. Uh, we've spent a lot of our history. This started about 20 years ago with the you know, addition of fat into diets. This is pretty standard. But again, there's some exercise physiology and some human nutrition we can bring into this. Carbohydrates. In general, we most feeds stay away from carbohydrates today. Uh, I'm fortunate to work for a feed company that developed Safe Choice 11 years ago that kind of revolutionized the feed industry. I mean, everybody followed suit to say we got to get away from carbs in our diets. 
It started with how do we avoid colic? But then it turned into, man, these horses are performing better. But as that pendulum swung, it swung, you know, we went for high carb feeds, then we switched to really low carb feeds, then we started getting calls that, man, my horses are, they don't have enough, they're not performing well. They're, they're, especially with certain types of work, they're not, they're not being able to carry through the day. Um, and so we swung maybe a little far and hopefully now we're swinging back to the center and we're using carbs and fat at the appropriate times based on where the horse is working and the type of work they're doing. So carbohydrates are that soluble starch and sugar. You'll see it on a feed tag as dietary starch, sugar, NSC, it, and fiber. Corn, oats, barley, beet pulp. Fats, you all know what fat is, vegetable oil, things like that. Um, but you gotta select the feed based on the proper sources and the amount of calories that a horse needs. Um, again, it's determined by genetics, type of work, and amount of work. Horses have three different muscle fiber types. Basically everything does. And again, this is somewhat determined by genetics, and determined by breed. So a slow tw uh, Arabs have more, a higher percentage of slow twitch muscle fibers than, than quarter horses do. But what is their muscle? You know, what do they look like? They're leaner, they're longer, they're, they're, they're you know, and if a quarter horse, we would call them slab-sided. You know, they just don't have that definition. But they can go out and go 100 miles. Quarter horses, stock breeds, they have a higher percentage of fast twitch. There are sprinters. Mixed, warm bloods, thoroughbreds, you know, they got a little bit of both, and they're kind of in the middle. Slow twitch needs fat. Fast twitch needs carbs. Mix, you can train to do either way. And you can train these muscles to burn different things. So I had the divine stupidity when I decided to go on the keto diet and basically go from about 200 grams of carbs in my daily diet to 20, I did it three weeks before a 150 mile bike ride. Not smart. Because I was so exhausted up until about a week before, my average speed on my bike dropped by about three or four miles an hour, I couldn't finish a ride, because my muscles were trained to burn carbs. And they had not adapted to burning fat yet. My wife and I eat these things they call fat bombs which is cream cheese, I don't know what else. I mean, we freeze them and it tastes like chocolate chip cookie dough. They're pure fat. We have adapted our bodies to burning fat and lost weight. We can do the same thing with horses. We actually, we've been ahead of the human side in the horse world because we've fed high fat diets more prevalently and got away from carbs. But the type of work you're doing also, you have a genetic component. In general, quarter horses are kind of carb hungry Thoroughbreds are really carb hungry. You get to other breeds, you throw them carbs and they're just, they have issues or they, they, they get loony. But the type of work you do also influences them. So what I've got here, another graph that's obviously very confusing, but it's comparing the heart rates, exercise heart rates of a human to a horse. So the average resting heart rate of a horse is somewhere around 30 to 40. That's the, that's the orange bar. Average heart rate of a human is a 50 to 60. My, my resting heart rate is 66. Um, the lactate threshold, which is the point at which the body has to change from convert using fat to carbs only, it goes from what we call aerobic metabolism, where they can burn fat, to anaerobic metabolism, where carbs are the only thing they can burn, in a human is about 150. Um, in a horse, it's about 180 to 190. So somewhere similar. The max heart rate's really where we're different. And that's why a horse has a higher, higher anaerobic threshold. So the max heart rate of a, of a human's up actually about 170. I found out last year when a blue healer tried to chase me on my bike that it's 176. Because <laughs> I got a heart rate monitor and <laughs> it was 171 until that day. <laughs> But a horse, we're well over 200. Um, so if we're doing speed events, raining, cutting, where you're, you're going all out, you're going to need some carbs in that diet. A high fat, high fiber, low starch diet will probably end up failing on that horse. If you've got all arounders, if you've got halter horses, if you've got something where they're not getting above that high heart rate at any point in time, we can go fat and fiber all day long. It's just, it's just the reality of the world. 
So, how many calories does that horse need? Same horse, again, if I'm looking at maintenance, about 18,000 calories a day. And when I say a kcal, a kcal in equine is the same thing as a calorie in our human food. So, you know, they always say a human needs 2,000 calories a day. Um, they're about 10 times what we are. Um, light training is 21,000. Moderate training is 25. Intense training is 29,000 calories a day. A lot of that they can just take up by eating more, eating more stuff. Uh, there's usually, usually calorie shortages are not an issue unless someone just doesn't have the money to feed their horse. Protein shortages are the, probably the number one nutritional deficiency I see in horses today. Um, how much time? Got five minutes left? Yeah. Okay. So some real world scenarios. What does this mean? How does this apply to you? What can you do about it? If you're buying hay more than a one month supply at a time, preferably three months supply at a time, you will pay for a forage analysis. Our Elk River lab, uh, we can do a forage test for $15 and know what your hay is. The only purpose of a feed is to supply the nutrition that's not in your hay. So if you get a really good load of hay in, you might not have to feed as much feed. But are you going to do that by guessing or are you going to do that by having it tested and, you know, finding out how much you really need? It's not expensive. Um, there's other labs that do it. It's pretty cost effective. If you're buying on the spot market, if you're buying from the feed store, or you're buying from somebody that's bringing you hay from random spots on a regular basis, you're just, it's not going to be, by the time you get the analysis back and you have somebody run the numbers, you're going to be out of it. Um, so, but you got to combine everything. Um, hay, feed, supplements, you know, you got to combine everything that you're doing. Because there are some supplements that we can overdo, specif specifically selenium. If we get too much selenium in a diet, it's, it's not a good thing. I mean, um, fortunately, most of the U.S. is selenium deficient in their forages. You get out to Colorado in the front range and you get some, I had a customer one time that says, yeah, my haze, my pasture is selenium toxic. The signs of selenium toxicity are losing mane and tail hair, I mean in clumps, or they'll shed their hoof capsule which is not good. Um, there are Zinpro, a partner of ours, has a, there's some research that they claim part of the reason Custer maybe lost the battle of Bighorn is he, is he pastured his horses before he went to fight a Bighorn in the Fort Collins area, which is a high selenium toxic area. Dr. Squires is back there shaking his head, thank goodness. Um, and um, some of the horses may have been dealing with selenium toxicity. You know, who would have thought of that? But uh, you got to know everything that's in that diet. So if I'm dealing with a 1,200-pound horse and I'm feeding it a maintenance horse, eight and a half pounds, I need that protein and all those percentages. How does that turn into an actual real-world feeding scenario? 14 pounds of a typical grass say. Five pounds of a product like Safe Choice. You may not need anything else. If it's an easy keeper. It may be a product like a balancer, which there's several on the market. We've got one called Empower Top Line Balance. But you jump up in training level, and now I'm in a horse and light training. I'm going to be about 21 pounds of hay on a grass hay. I may jump up to a product like Fuel, which is a 13% fat. Uh, specifically, if I'm doing aerobic work, so I like our all-arounders. This is what my all-arounders, my wife's all-arounders, that's what they eat. And then we'll come in with like a product like Top Line Extreme post-exercise to really give them that exercise recovery benefit. If they're in anaerobic work, barrel racers, ropers, speed events, I got a product called Pro Force XTN that I throw more carbs into. But I'm still going to do everything else. Feeding rates are about the same. I'll skip that one. So horses are individuals. We're trying to bring new techniques and management and, and nutrition in from the, from the human world. Um, there's resources available. We're here. There's other vet companies out there. There's feed companies all over the place. We're here to help. There's universities, extension. Um, but put nutrition to work for you. It's not just feed. 
is more than that. It, it makes your management and the genetics of that horse work at its peak efficiency. So with that, I probably took my time up for questions, but like Sam, I'll be around and uh, we'll appreciate your time and appreciate giving back.